Today is March 27, 2013, and we are interviewing Tim Alexander at the O'Fallon Public Library. Tim was born June 15, 1971. My name is Cheryl Walker, and I'll be interviewing Tim. And we have Deborah, who is the newsletter, who is the court reporter today. And Tim, could you state for the record what conflict and branch of service you served in? I was in Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, uh, while I was in the Army Reserves. And then I was active duty Navy during Operation uh, Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom. Okay, what years of the service were you in? I was in the Reserves from December of 1988 until February of 1992. And then I was active duty Navy from February of 92 until May of 2007. Okay. And what rank did you retire at or I, get out at? I was an E3 when I got out of the reserves, and then I was a, a E6 when I was medically retired in 2007 from the Navy. Okay. What made you decide to go into the reserves? <laughs> well, I, I was a junior in high school at the time, and um, I was out running around with a friend of mine and he had to go check in with his recruiter. He was a senior in high school and he had already uh, signed up to go active duty army. And we went in to check in. I was just talking to his recruiter and uh, they had a program back then where you could go to, if you went into the reserves, you could go to basic training in between your junior and senior year of high school. And then after your senior year of high school, do your uh, advanced training and then just be a reservist from there. And so that's how I got in to the reserves and after I got home from my <clears throat> advanced training I wanted to go active duty army and I wanted to talk to the recruiter and at that time um, Kuwait had already been invaded this was uh, late 1990 and uh, he made a couple phone calls and he told me that I couldn't because my reserve unit was on the list to be activated to deploy in support of a uh, operation at that time, Desert Shield. And then the first week of December of 1990, we received phone calls that we were activated for Desert Shield. And uh, we went to our reserve unit, which at that time was in Wood River, Illinois. <laughs> and four days later, we went down to uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. We were down there for, I don't know, about a month, month and a half. And then we flew over to the Gulf for uh, about five months. To, in support of uh, Desert Shield, and which turned into Desert Storm. And then when I came home from the Gulf a couple weeks later, I went in to talk to my recruiter who was still there to see if I if I could you know switch over you know to active duty. And like at the end of any conflict, we weren't drawdown at that time. So he said, you know, you have too much active duty time, so I can't at this point just keep checking in with me. And probably for about the next six months or so, I was calling him weekly, and he was telling me the same thing. And then I went in to see him, and <clears throat> in uh, the summer of 91, and got the same story. And I was walking out, and I was sitting outside waiting for a friend of mine to come pick me up, and a Navy recruiter walked, he was walking in, and I guess I had a look on my face or something, he asked me what was wrong, and I told him, he said, come on in, let's talk. And the next thing I know, I was signed up to go in the Navy. So I went to Navy basic training in Great Lakes, Illinois, and then uh, down to Meridian, Mississippi for my advanced training. And uh, from there, I went to uh, Puerto Rico and started my career for the next 15 years in the Navy. Back to your time in, in the reserves. <clears throat> Did you, where did you take your basic training in the reserves? Uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana. And then my advanced training was in uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland. Okay. The time that you were in the reserves, what was your MOS? I was a uh, 45 Bravo, which is a uh, small arms repairman. Basically all of the, uh, the handguns and all of the uh, machine guns and pretty much anything that any of the soldiers carried with them uh, my job was to do maintenance on them and uh, repairs that could not be done by uh, just the average everyday uh, 
soldier. And you were stationed in Kuwait at that time? When we you were, were with this reserve? When we uh, first deployed over there, we went to uh, Saudi Arabia and we had to wait for our uh, equipment and stuff to get there. And then once it got there, we moved up uh, north right off. Because at, at that time, the air war was going on, but the ground war had not started yet. And we moved up north uh, right off the uh, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Kuwait border. It makes kind of a little point right there. And we, we moved up there. And uh, we weren't sure if we were going to do anything or, you know, if we were just going to. We had no clue what we were going to do. And then a, a couple of days before the. Uh, ground war began, they, uh, my uh, platoon sergeant asked me if I'd be interested in driving, uh, volunteering to drive a fuel truck. I didn't know, you know, what, what it was for or anything. So I said, sure, why not? You know, we'd been basically sitting there for a month and a half doing nothing, <laughs> a whole lot of nothing anyway. So I was bored. And so there were about, uh, eight of us and we went over to the, uh, battalion to, basically to be briefed and they told us that we would be driving 55 gallon or not the 55 gallon I'm sorry the huge uh, tanker trucks full of uh, diesel fuel and we'd be rolling with the uh, units as they went into into uh, Iraq and uh, you know I, at 19 I'm like you know hey this is kind of cool but then I thought about thinking about it that the, the uh, morning that we moved into Iraq uh, we were about four, I was about four or five vehicles back and the uh, lead vehicle came over the radios and told all of us, hey, he's getting ready to cross into Iraq, it's time to go. And at that point, it kind of hit me. I'm like, oh crap, I'm sitting on, I don't know how many thousands of gallons of gas and diesel fuel that I'm sitting on, but, you know, nothing, nothing happened with that. And we uh, proceeded up into Iraq. Basically, we were just the you know we were probably fairly protected because we had the gas and they knew they would need the gas at some point and we came you know uh we came up and around and there was a unit in front of us that was doing the bulk of the fighting and they were uh we got to the airport in kuwait we were right outside the airport and the uh unit that was in front of us that we were doing the bulk of the supporting for they were doing all the actual fighting there and it uh it, it wasn't long you know, looking back on it, but at the time it felt like we were sitting there for, for days and I know it wasn't that long. And then <clears throat> once that uh, got all cleared up, you know, three and a half, four days later, the ground war was over and uh, <clears throat> we were driving. They, you know, they still had us doing some other support stuff because they were still sending units further up into Kuwait to make sure everything was okay and all the Iraqis were out of there. And, the uh, road that we took going back and forth every day, we couldn't actually take the road. We had to drive on the outsides of the road because it was uh, the main highway. I can't remember what the number of the highway was, but it was the one that the media here in America deemed the highway to hell. And I was 19 at the time, and I, I saw stuff on that road that I still remember to this day, and it's, you know, just... I don't know, just, you know, all the stuff blown up and, you know, everything where the Iraqis were trying to get out of there. Well, anyway, we stayed there for probably about a month doing different uh, things with the, that unit that they just need us, needed us to help them with. And then we uh, went back to our unit. And then a couple of months later, we just stayed in the area and just did our regular jobs, maintenance. And, you know, we also... In my unit, there were guys that worked on uh, trucks. So it, as the units were pulling out of Kuwait and out of uh, northern Saudi Arabia, if they needed to work done on them, uh, they came to us. And then a few months later, we uh, ended up coming back. We left uh, Saudi Arabia and went back to Fort Leonard with Missouri for about uh, two weeks to get uh, demobilized. And then we came back home and were sent on our way. While you were in um, activated, how many men and women, how many soldiers were in your unit? Uh, my unit had, I won't say, 
probably about a hundred. We weren't that well, we weren't that large, and we did have both men and women in our in our unit. Mm -hmm. So you really didn't work within your MOS. No, not while I was over there. No, I did not. Did you have? Um, you had a lot of downtime. So what did you do during that downtime over there? Uh, a, a lot of uh, maintenance on equipment and guns, a lot of playing cards, a lot of, you know, just sitting around shooting the breeze, trying to figure out something to make the time. I mean, we only had a couple of months of downtime. I can't imagine what it was like for the guys that got over there in the middle of August of 1990 and didn't see anything happening until, you know, early 1991. I couldn't even imagine sitting over there that long, just in a sandbox for days on end. What was the weather like during your time over there? It was probably in the mid to upper 90s during the day. And then it, I actually, I don't know how cold it got at night. I remember it, it always felt really cold because the temperature dropped and you'd have, you know, you'd, you'd go from sweating during the day to an hour after sun, the sun went down, having to put on your, the coat that we wore back in Fort Underwood, Missouri in, you know, January, you know, because it went from just extremes from, like I said, mid to upper 90s to what felt like freezing cold at night. I mean, it may have only been down in like the 40s or 50s, but it just felt really, really cold. Did you have um, the ability to go with in the surroundings or did you have to stay on the compound? You, you stayed on the compound unless you had a... A, a reason to go somewhere, and we very rarely had reasons to go somewhere. So, yeah, once we got up up north and got settled into our compound, you pretty much stayed there the entire time. While you were there, um, compared to when you went back or when you were in the Navy, were the um, the rations, the food, the supplies, were they pretty plentiful? Well, we had, uh, our, we always had a hot breakfast and then our lunch and dinner would be MREs, the meals ready to eat. I mean, we always had enough to eat, but you know, you eat out of a bag twice a day for months on end, you know, you get home. I remember when we got back to uh, Fort Leonard Wood, that first day back there, a bunch of us went to uh, Burger King on base and ate because we wanted some real food. That was a mistake. We were all sick for hours after that, and it, you know, we went to the to the medics, and they said it's just because you ate, <clears throat> excuse me, you ate real food, and your system not used to real food. So, so you came back to Fort Leonard Wood and ate a Burger King, mm -hmm. and all got sick, and all got sick. Mm -hmm. So you really, honestly, they should have told you to introduce real food slowly. They probably should have, but I mean, nobody. Thinks, you know, you don't think about that. You think, oh, yeah, you'll be fine, but no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, during that time, what awards or medals did you receive? Uh, the Liberation of Kuwait Medal, uh, the uh, Operation, the Southwest Asia Service Medal, which was the, the one that was issued out for uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, <coughs> and then a uh, Army uh, Commendation Medal, and that was for the volunteering to do the the driving of the the fuel trucks. Because we were actually the the eight of us that uh, volunteered for it. We were presented that medal in still in country. We were in uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, General Schwarzkopf actually presented all of us that medal. And he told us, he said, I'd never heard of you guys before, but when I read these awards, you guys were eight of the craziest fill-in-the-blank individuals that I, I can think of. He said, and he, he asked all of us, why did you volunteer to drive a truck full of fuel? And we all basically said the same thing. We were bored. We wanted something to do. And again, he told us we were crazy individuals. What was that like meeting General Swartz? In a way, it was, it was surreal, but then he was kind of, he was almost like a, a grandfather figure. I mean, yes, you know, he's a four-star general. He's the man that just, you know, led a, a four-day, you know, ground campaign and got it all done. But he, he came across, at least to me, as a type of individual, you take off the uniform, he could be 
anybody's grandfather you see walking his, his granddaughter through, you know, the, the store back home. He was not, he didn't come across as, you know, I'm a four-star general, I'm, I'm better than you. He just was an everyday, everyday guy. Well, okay, you said that <coughs> there were eight of you who yes. volunteered. Were they all men? Were yeah. some of them women? No, they were all they were all men. They were, I'm not sure if any of the women volunteered for it, but at that time the uh, female soldiers were not allowed in combat. So being in those fuel trucks driving across the border into Iraq, not knowing what was going to happen, that was considered combat. So they were not even if they would have volunteered, they would have not been allowed to do it. Okay, that brings up a question. Did you find that from that time in the reserves and that conflict to your later years in the Navy and your later years in, was it Operation? It, we worked, uh, I was in units that supported Operation Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom. Okay. Were the women treated differently in those different conflicts? I, I, yeah, the, no, they were treated differently in the sense that more opportunities opened up for them to be able to serve. I mean, just recently they were, uh, uh, legislation was changed where they could actually start serving in combat now, but they did serve more uh, roles. You know, I've heard and read of where, you know, there were female soldiers doing the job that, you know, I did back in, you know, 1991. They were driving uh, fuel vehicles or other support vehicles or whatnot actually in harm's harm's way there were uh they're actually uh combat pilots now both for uh airplanes and helicopters so yeah it's a lot has changed in that 20 years if you had the chance to do this again and would you volunteer again to drive a fuel truck yes so it was an experience that you felt was a good experience for you. Well, like I said, we've been sitting there for a couple of months bored. And I, the way I look at it, when they came and asked if I wanted to do it, if if it wasn't meant to be, or you know, if God didn't want me to do it, he would have said, uh, "Say no, dummy." And he didn't say that, so I said, "Sure, let's do it." So those eight men, do you have a camaraderie with them? To this day, uh, there's a, a couple of them that I still talk to. Uh, three of them have actually uh, passed away, but there's a, a couple of them that I still keep in contact with. Do you stay in touch with any of those others? No, we just lost touch over the years. Now let's go on to your Navy career. How long were you in the Navy? Uh, Fourteen years. Yeah, a little 14, from February of 92 to May of 97. Okay, and you had to go through basic for Navy. Yes, at uh, Great Lakes, Illinois, which is uh, just up north of Chicago. Did you get to keep your rank when you transferred from the Army Reserves yes. to the Navy? Yeah, I got to keep that. You did? Mm -hmm. Okay, and did you get to keep your pay grade? Yes. Okay, so there was a benefit. Yeah, that was a benefit. Okay. And then you went on to, is it called AIT? It's called, uh, it's called A School, Advanced Schools, and I, that was in uh, Meridian, Mississippi. Okay. And then after that, you went to Puerto Rico. I went to Puerto Rico for two years. There uh, used to be a uh, naval station down there, and I was down there for just short of two years. And then from there, I, uh, I was an aviation storekeeper, which was uh, supplies basically the supply department for the uh, aircraft. And then from there, I transferred to uh, Norfolk, Virginia, to uh, a VAW, which is a, it's a carrier airborne early warning squadron, 123 in Norfolk. And what those aircraft do when we go on board the carriers and go out to sea, they fly the, uh, they're basically the eyes for the, the airplanes. They're the uh, planes that have the big domes, the big radar dishes on top, and they, uh, Basically, they take off before any of the other planes do, and they just keep an eye on everything to make sure nothing's going to, 
you know, nothing's coming at them that they can't pick up. Did you ever get to ride on any of those? No. Never had the opportunity to fly on any of the planes. Were you on any of the ships? Uh, yes, I was on, when I was in that squadron, we did, uh, I did one deployment and it was the final deployment of the uh, USS America. And uh, that was in 90, what was that? 90, late 95 into 96, because then when we came home, uh, she ended up going up to the shipyard up in Philadelphia and she was decommissioned because she was just old and been abused over the years. How many ships were you on, actively on? Uh, four. I did uh, the cruise, the deployment on board the America, and then I did uh, a couple of short. Uh, underway periods on board the Enterprise and a couple of short underway periods on board the uh, Theodore Roosevelt and then I was a ship's company out in Everett Washington on board the uh, Abraham Lincoln from uh, 99 to 2003. When you say under... Underway that means when we go out to sea I'm sorry this when we pull out from the pier and we go out to sea either for anywhere from two weeks to a couple of months to just do what's called workups and that's basically where you get the crew ready to go for an extended amount of time. The uh, pilots have to do so many takeoffs and landings from the ship prior to it going on a you know, six or however many month deployment. And during that time what was your um, job? What was your <coughs> I was a uh, Aviation storekeeper. I worked in the uh, supply department, and uh, I had different different jobs throughout the uh, over the, the years. I mean, I everything from working in a uh, a, a storeroom, uh, you know, just maintaining the inventory in there, uh, up to uh, expediting uh, for uh, items that we didn't have on board the ship that we needed to get on board. You know, just working with different. Uh, people and vendors and everything back here in the in the states to get the parts out to us. And How would they get the supplies to you when you were out to sea? They could either, well, depending on where we were in the world. Like if we were on the other side of the world, they would go on a either a commercial or a military uh, airliner to uh, an airport close to where we were, and then there were. Uh, Navy people that were actually on the ground, they would get the stuff and then uh, again depending on how far we were from the shore they could either put it on a helicopter and send it out to us or they could put it on a, a, a C2 uh, which is basically a, a plane that's just completely opened up in the back and they could just fill that with supplies and bring that out to us that way. And then would they land? They'd la yeah, they'd land on board the ship and they parked and then the back would open up and everything. There was a, a, a group that actually unloaded everything and then brought it down to the, uh, from the flight deck. They would get on one of the flight deck elevators and just bring it down to the uh, hangar bay. And then from there it would go to whoever it belonged to. How many floors were actually on your ships? Uh, from the flight deck down there were eight eight stories down and then the uh the island which is the tall skinny part that you see on the uh aircraft carrier that had uh i think four or five i'm not positive about that but they're they're big ships okay when you hear of these big ships and they're out in the sea and there's turbulence um <clears throat> Here in the year 2000s, many times you hear that they have, I don't know what they call, but they have arms that extend stabilizers. Do um, Navy uh, ships no. have those? No. They have a, a lot of the, the commercial boats that you're talking about that are stabilizers, they're flat bottomed to where the Navy ships are uh, be bottom so they go through the water a little I mean you can still rock and roll uh, you know a, a little bit if you get really bad weather but they go through the water a lot better than like say the carnival cruise ships or some of these other ships that you're 
that have the flat bottoms to them. So their speed is much faster. Oh, yeah, much faster. Okay. When you're out at sea and you're on the ship, what type of commodities, meals? Uh, you get, there are, uh, on, on the carrier, there are uh, two galleys, which are two, two kitchens, and they serve uh, four meals, four hot meals a day. You get breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then there's what's called a, a mid rats, which basically it's like a dinner at midnight, from like midnight to two in the morning for the people that work the, uh, the night the, the night shift. So you can pretty much, the way the, the schedules work with the two galleys, you can pretty much eat probably 18 hours a day. Because one will be open for breakfast and then one is getting ready to close, the other one will open for breakfast and they just keep rotating it back and forth just because of the different shifts that people work. And, what was an average breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Just pretty much normal, you know, normal food like breakfast. You could have like eggs, you know, pancakes, waffles. I mean, it, it all really all the meals it depended because the longer we were out and before we were getting ready to get another supply of food on board, the kind of the, the worst of the food got because you know you were starting to run low on stuff. You may only have like powdered eggs for breakfast and chicken nuggets for lunch and whatever they could find for, for dinner. But for the most part, the food was a whole lot better than the food in the desert, so. Um, and when you were on, out at sea, did you feel any pressures or did stress seem to elevate because of the close quarters or anything? Maybe about the only time that you could tell when people were starting to get each, on each other's nerves were probably the last two or three weeks of the deployment because you knew you were close to home at that point. You've been with these people for however many months. You were just basically sick of them and ready to go home. So that's the last few weeks was when it got to be the worst. Okay, let me ask you about um, communicating with your family. How was that? <clears throat> Most of the time it, it was okay. You, you had uh, email out there, so I would say, you know, 80-85% of the time the email was up, you know, and running it. it it's not like email here in the States, you know, where I can send you an email and you get it right now. I mean, it could take depending on the bandwidth and a whole lot of other factors. I mean, it could take, you know, several hours for email to get back and forth, but it, it wasn't bad. Um, there were some phones on the ships, you know, some people used them, some people, I mean, I just communicated through email and, you know, I didn't want to deal with the, the phones because they were, again, it, it was bad. You know, if you go through bad weather, you could, you know, you could get cut off. There was a, a delay, you know, I, I'd say something to you and it'd take a second or two for you to hear it. And, Vice versa, so it just wasn't worth the hassle to do the phone calls. Okay. Um, Tim, they, a lot of people um, have, were asked, have <coughs> been asked to co collect phone calls or donate, um, not phone calls, donate phone cards or donate their old cell phones. To the soldiers, did you ever get any of that benefit? Uh, we did not in in the Navy, and then in, when I was in the Army Reserves, we did get some uh, calling cards and phone cards. There weren't cell phones back then, but most of those, like today and during uh, the, the things that uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, those went to the and rightfully so to the to the guys who were actually on the ground. I mean. Yes, people can say, you know, Navy life sucks, you know, because I'm on a boat and I'm in a room living with a hundred other people and this and that and the other, but, you know, we weren't getting shot at. We had showers every day. Granted, sometimes they were cold, sometimes they were hot. We had, you know, hot food every day, so, to, you know, send that stuff to the guys that deserve it. And that, I mean, that's just, that's my take on it. What about a lot of these schools um, had our churches and other organizations had the kids um, 
write or make cards and send cards and organizations were sending cards. Did you benefit from that? Yeah, we did. We got a, a few of those, the, the letters from the kids, and those are those are nice, you know, because that, I mean, you, you know your, your family cares about you back home, you know, you communicate with your family, but then to get stuff like that from total, you know, total strangers, it, it, it was, it was nice. Okay, um, okay, so being out on the ship we talked about, was there anything else you wanted to talk about the ship? No, not that I can, okay. not that I can think of. Did you have any experiences that, um, did you guys do any kind of um, pranks on each other when you were on the ship? Was there time to relax? Well, there, there was there was time to relax because you worked uh, twelve hour shifts. So when you got off of work, you could you know watch TV. They had a couple of uh, different movie channels on there, and occasionally we could get you know like some some news or whatever. You could read. You could you know work out, but. There, I mean, there wasn't a whole lot to do out there. So they had a library for you? Well, no, if you brought uh, books or oh. magazines with you or if you had family send stuff to you or when we pulled into a, a port somewhere, if you could find a place that had English uh, literature, you know, then you could pick that up and just have it with you. What kind of ports did you go to? Uh, let's see. Went to Hawaii a couple of times, Australia, Singapore. Hong Kong, went to let's see Italy, Greece, France, Turkey. I think that I think that's it. I mean, there's probably a few more that I can't remember. So, did you purchase anything at those ports? No, I mean just little, you know, like a little shot glass or a little T-shirt or nothing. You know, because you didn't have much storage room on board the ship, so you didn't really buy too much. Do you still have those? Uh huh. That shot glass from pretty much around the world. That's nice. Yeah. That's nice. Um. Okay. Did you keep a personal diary at all during your service time? No. No. Now. Okay. So you were also in Operation Iraqi Freedom mm -hmm. and Operation Indirect Freedom. Indirect Freedom. Yeah, I was in the, the Navy for both of those and we provided, uh, I was on actually the Abraham Lincoln for both of those and we provided air support for the troops on the ground. Okay, and how long were you, were you out to sea at that time? Yes. For actually, it was all one. Yeah, it was all the the one deployment. It was supposed to be a six month deployment. We were supposed to go over for uh, just just support of enduring freedom <clears throat> because Iraqi freedom wasn't. I mean, I'm sure it was thought about somewhere in you know Washington or somewhere, but it wasn't. You know, nobody knew about that. So we did our uh, our time off of. Uh, Afghanistan doing the support there and we went into the uh, Persian Gulf just for like a month or so to do the uh, flights that uh, basically make sure Iraq was playing nice still from well uh, what was agreed upon to end Desert Shield Desert Storm and we came out of there and we went to uh, Perth Australia for Christmas we pulled out of Perth and we were actually we were supposed to be heading home, heading back to uh, Everett, Washington. Pulled out of Perth, came up around the north, uh, was it, off the west side of the country, made the turn, and New Year's Day of 2003, we turned around and uh, we were told that we were going back to the Gulf because of Operation uh, Iraqi Freedom that was happening. That ended up being a 10-month deployment. So that was from January. No, that was from. It started in July of two thousand and two, and it ended in May of two thousand and three. So that was ten months. Quite a while. Yeah. To be out to sea. Oh yeah. 
Oh yeah, because that that last four months of it, we were out to sea the entire time. We did not we did not pull in in anywhere until we were back on our way home for good that time. And we pulled into Hawaii for a couple of days just to offload some stuff, and then we pulled out of Hawaii and headed home from there. What kind of um, flights took off from you? We had uh, F-14 Tomcats with the F-18, uh, both the Hornets and the Super Hornets. We had the uh, E-2 Hawkeyes and then uh, two or three different uh, helicopter squadrons that we had on board. Now when the pilots would pull in, how long would they stay in on the ship or on the carrier? From they were with us the entire time we were on the deployment. We picked they came on board before we left the states in like July, and then they stayed with us until the end. The planes were on board the entire time. Okay. <clears throat> um, can you tell me about a couple of your most memorable experiences? Um, probably not, well, definitely not a, a good memory, but we were in, <clears throat> when I was on the Abraham Lincoln, we'd done uh, one deployment and we went into the, uh, what's called the yard where you go to basically a repair facility to be, we were in there for six months to have work done on us. And, uh, uh, 5.30 in the morning on September 11, 2001, I was driving to work, and I heard on the radio where the first tower had gotten hit. And I remember thinking, damn, I wonder what happened to that plane or that pilot or whatever the case might be. And as I'm pulling into the, my, into the parking lot on the base, that's when the second plane hit. And I said to myself right then, I said, you know, all hell's breaking loose, something's going on. And I remember... Get on the ship, and there were a couple of guys watching TV, and they're like, you know, they none of us knew at that time what was going on. And I said, we're being attacked, and they looked at me like I had two heads, and I'm like, no, you don't have two airplanes that close together hit two towers. And out of the entire time I was in both the reserves and the Navy, that is the one day I can honestly say that I did not see any work get done that day. Nobody expected anything to get done that day because we did not know what what was going to happen. And that, I mean, we all know what happened from there. But, yeah, that was probably the most memorable day because we all felt, you know, talking about it that afternoon, we all felt helpless. Here we were, the, the ship was sitting basically on wooden blocks. You know, we weren't in the water. We knew we couldn't go anywhere for a couple of months. And, you know, the stuff sitting in the fan. And there was nothing that we could nothing we could do about it. And as a military person, you felt you should be able to do something? If they would have came to us and said, we need volunteers, we don't know what you're going to be doing, but we're going to drop you out of airplanes over to Afghanistan, who wants to go? I, I would have I gone. I'd go today if they wanted me to go. And were you in Norfolk at that time? No, I was in uh, Everett, Washington at that time, Yeah, it's north of uh, Seattle. So that was, as everybody in the United States felt, that was, you know, a very traumatic time for us. And, but as a military personnel, you saw a base become... A ghost town, basically. I mean, nobody just did... stood still. Basically. The whole point, yeah, just stood still. Nobody did anything that day. Um... Did you have something that you carried uh, as a special good luck piece? I had my, uh, my mom gave it to me before I went to, uh, when my reserve unit got activated for a Desert uh, Shield, Desert Storm. She had a uh, little St. Francis medal on a, it was on a uh, really thin, chain and she gave that to me and I, I told her I was going to take it off the chain and put it on my dog tag chain because I didn't want that thin chain to break and 
I, I wore the, those the entire time we were over there. And then uh, I couldn't wear them to Navy boot camp because Navy gives you their own set. But then when I got out of Navy boot camp, that set went in a drawer somewhere and I wore, I had that, my set of Army dog tags with that St. Francis medal on it that I wore pretty much every day for the entire time I was in the Navy. Do you still have them? Mm -hmm. That's at home. Um, how many times were you able to go on leave? Do you remember? Uh, I can't remember. You, you were able to go pretty often on leave. And did you do any traveling on your leave or did you come home? I, I came. Most of the time I, I'd come home. You'd come home? Yeah. Okay. Um, were you single during your time in the military? All except the last four years I was single. Did you meet your uh, spouse in the military? No, I met her. She would live back here in, in the area and I, I met her here. Did you communicate during your time in the military with her? Uh, via e email. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you recall the day your service ended? May 7th, 2007. That was my last day. Did you have time that you had to take before it actually was, was that your service out? That was just my service out, yeah. Service out. That was my service out. Mm -hmm. Were, uh, where were you when you were discharged? Uh, in uh, Great Lakes, Illinois. Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. Did your family come, or did you come to? My, my wife was, uh, my, me and my wife lived up there at the time, so. Did you live in military housing with your wife? No, no, we lived out, out in town. Did they provide, um, what kind of, um, did they provide certain areas that you had to live? Did they? No, you could live wherever you wanted wherever. to. Wherever. Mm -hmm. Um, what did you do the days and weeks after you uh, got out of the service? Really, it it was several months before I did much of anything because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I always kind of joked that every time I re-enlisted in the military, people would say, why are you still re-enlisting? I said, because I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And I still didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, and it just... After, you know, being a, associated with the military in one way, shape, or form from the time you're 18 until the time you're 36, you know, and then all of a sudden it's not there anymore. You don't know what to do. You have no routine anymore. You don't know, you know, Basically, you, you don't know what you're going to do. It's not, okay, I'm going to get up and I'm going to put that on, and I know I'm going to wear that regardless if I want to wear that or not. That's what I'm wearing tomorrow. And it just, it, it wasn't there anymore. Did you go back to school at all? Well, a, a little bit. I'm you know, still going to, to school now. I'm just taking classes here, here and there. Our, um... Are you currently, do you currently work? Yes. What are you doing now? I'm a uh, purchasing agent for the Homeland Security. So you're working in a military position? What? what so, uh, a government yeah, position? The government, yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you like that? It's okay. I like it. Keeps me off the streets. Keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> the government, um, once you're in the military, do you feel that it just... If you've been in the military for a while, it's hard to let go. Do you feel that? Yeah. Because of the regiment? The the regiment, the camaraderie, the, the brotherhood, the knowing that the guy sitting next to you, you guys at this minute in time might hate each other and might want to, you know, get in a fight with each other. But if something happens, you know, he has your back and he knows, you know, and vice, vice versa because one when you need each other, the everything else goes out 
out the window all the, you know, I hate that guy, or that guy did this to me, or whatever the case might be. It's all water under the bridge. Now, after whatever you need him for is resolved, you guys go back to hating each other, but, or whatever, you know, whatever the case may be. But at that moment in time, it's, it's all, it's in the past. I want to go back to the Navy. Um, what medals did you get in the Navy? Uh, the Global War on uh, two different Global War on Terrorism medals, a, uh, a NATO medal, another Southwest Asia uh, Service medal, uh, Navy Achievement medal, Good Conduct medal. And I think that's all or not positive. Could you explain what a global war? There were two uh, global war on terrorism uh, medals. One was a, a service medal and then one was an expeditionary medal. The expeditionary medal was given to any units that participated in uh, Operation Enduring Freedom. And then the uh, service ribbon was basically just, it's kind of like the National Defense Medal. Anybody that was in the service during this time to this time got that, uh, the World War on Terrorism Service Medal. What about the NATO Medal? What is that? It was for, it was for when I was on the uh, USS America. We provided support for the uh, conflict in uh Kosovo and Bosnia back in 90, what was that, 95, I think it was. I can't remember when it was, but we got that from NATO for uh, uh, for provide support to the uh, NATO forces that were on the ground during the, the conflict in Kosovo. Okay. Very interesting. So you actually were out in... Kosovo, too. Well, we were in the Mediterranean Sea, so we weren't actually on the ground in, in Kosovo. We were in the Mediterranean. Well, you're just a world traveler. <laughs> Those days are done. Have you ever wanted to go back to any of these places? Not really. I mean, they're all nice to visit and all nice to see, but no, I'm where I want to be. Um, do you have any children? No. Did you um, join any veterans organization? The uh, Disabled American Veterans and the uh, American Legion. Okay. Do you feel a camaraderie with them? Yes. Okay. Would you suggest to any soldier um, to join a, Mer uh, a veterans organization? Uh, yes, because you, I, I mean, I feel, you know, I, <clears throat> I can talk to my wife, I can talk to family, I can, you know, Talk to friends of mine that have not been in the military, but it's not, it's not the same I, as talking to somebody who's actually, you know, because if you're, you know, if you have something, you know, going on, you know, medically or, you know, whatever the case may be related to your service, you can talk to, you know, your wife or whoever until you're blue in the face and she, you know, may or may not understand, but, you know, you can talk to one of your brothers and they, they know, even if they don't have the same problems, they have other stuff going on and they, you know, they, understand more than someone that hasn't been there. Do you, do they have the ability to help you with um, dealing with the vet, um, veteran benefits? Yes. Yeah, both do. They help you with, yeah, they help you file your, file any uh, claims for uh, benefits or for compensation and they all both have a lot of good programs. Do you take advantage of all the benefits? Yes. Would you advise any veteran to use those benefits? Yes. They, you are the, you, you get it. Okay. Okay. A question I would like to ask is, um, do you feel that war and history in school is being taught accurately. I have a, a niece that's actually a freshman in high school and they 
fair. I remember at her going growing up through school, they rarely teach American history anymore in, in schools. And when they do, it may be just like a, a couple of sentences or a couple of paragraphs. So, so no, I, I think that the, the kids of, of today, they don't, they're, I don't think they're getting everything they, they should out of it. You know, I mean, they may have like one little paragraph that describes World War II. Well, yes, a, a, a child doesn't need to, you know, go through weeks worth of classes about World War II, but they need to know more than, you know, a, a little blurb about it. I mean, I, I think, because if, if they don't learn from it, we may repeat it. And we don't want to, we don't want to repeat it. What is the most positive thing you took away from your experience in the service? The f fact that you can have people from so many different ethnic, religious backgrounds, uh, different walks of life, and you get all of them together, you put the same uniform on, and that all it all goes away. You're not, you know, African American. You're not white. You're not Hispanic. You know, you're not Catholic. You're not Jewish. You're not Baptist. You're all just one, one unit, one family working for the same goal. If there was one thing <clears throat> that you would change, or more than one thing that you would change about your military experience, or how the military whatever treated you or you feel was negative, what would that be? I don't know what caused the the injuries that I had that caused me to be medically retired, but if I could go back and change something, it would be whatever happened to cause me to get hurt to, in my career because I had full intentions of doing 20 or more years in the military, and I would actually still be in the military today if I would not have gotten hurt. Do you want to talk about how you got hurt? No, no, no. Okay. Has anyone ever thanked you for your serving our country? Yes, yeah, you have people. Mainly what, uh, most of the time, whatever, <clears throat> uh, we're out doing our uh, fundraisers with the disabled American veterans, people, you know, thank us or they'll look at me and they'll, they'll say you're too young to be a disabled veteran and I tell them you know there are kids that are 19 20 years old that don't have limbs so don't think that you know looking at me in, in my early 40s that I'm too young because I guess the stereo stereotypical disabled veteran is a Korean veteran a World War II veteran they look for old to assume you know disabilities and I guess that's just a misconception with our society even though you know it's on the news or it was on the news every day about you know these young people getting killed or you know losing limbs it's like people don't they don't think about it is there anything else you'd like to say Tim no I don't think so well I want to thank you for the time that you gave us today thank for you. your interview I really appreciate it. I appreciate your service for our country. I appreciate your story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.